HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast. Uh, continues to enjoy inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to. Uh, This is absolutely because of the wonderful guests who join me for a conversation so that all of you can uh, get the answers that you need and do better things in your business. Uh, Today is no exception. Today my guest is Marina Darlow. Marina is a systems expert and a productivity geek. She sees her job as helping impact-driven entrepreneurs get 10 to 20 more productive hours a week, stop leaking money, and prevent stress-fueled breakdowns. An engineer by training, Marina founded Vision Framework, a company that builds small, purpose-driven businesses from the inside, helping entrepreneurs run their companies with ease by putting effective, easy-to-use, and fun, yeah, she says fun, systems in place. Thanks so much for joining me today, Marina. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am thrilled to have you. Uh, Systems are uh, some of my favorite things. Uh, Everyone who knows me knows that I'm a real, you know, system process sort of person. So I'm so excited that we're talking about this uh, because I think so many business owners and, and even just, you know, business leaders struggle with, uh, they feel like they don't have enough time. They feel like they don't have enough hours to get everything done that they need to get done. Yeah. You know, I think part of it is because people who start businesses and people who become successful in businesses belong to what can be broadly categorized as a visionary type where you have the ability to imagine a different reality. You have the ability to create it and you have the charisma to lead other people with you. 
And it's usually like big picture thinking, tons of energy, this amazing way above average creativity. However, this is not necessarily the skill set of a manager. They are two different temperaments, if you will, different ways of thinking. Like, yes, there are people who possess both, but they're really, really rare. So in a sense, if you possess the skill set and the personality to start a successful business, very often you would find lacking on the, you know, linear, systematic, process-oriented way of thinking, which is exactly like what I see, um, like you said, leaders start struggling with systems, then they have bring on somebody who feels very comfortable, you know, navigating the processes, <clears throat> sorry, rather than imagining the next big leap forward. Yeah, I got to tell you, I am so thrilled that you just said that. I, am, I have a client who is struggling with this, this exact thing, um, works for an entrepreneur who's very you know, big picture and anything's possible and, and whatnot. And this client of mine is in the production side of things where there have to be systems. There has to be structure. And it's so interesting, you know, figuring out how to uh, interact when they see the world so differently. Yeah. You know, um, so I work quite a lot with people who are gifted with some kind of ADD, probably for the same reason that I work with entrepreneurs. A, this big vision. B, they lack on the system side. And that made me, you know, explore and research into the ADHD world. And there's the, one of the biggest names there, Dr. Halliwell, who says that if you have attention deficit and you have these grand ideas that you really want to bring to life, you need to pair yourself. Um, I'm saying it wrong. Like basically you need to bring on board somebody with a surplus of attention. Yeah. Yeah. Right, the, the systems person. I think the most famous example would be Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, who is the COO. Because this is just, you know, this is just how it works. The, you know, how very often there are two co-founders to a startup that takes off. I think it's yeah. because of that. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I think that's, that's a great point. So, so let's talk about systems. So what systems <clears throat> do you personally swear by? Me? Yes. I think the basics, my calendar, my reminders, um, my spreadsheets, very much so. Like I do almost everything. Everything has a spreadsheet, including my spiritual practices. Anything specific at this time? Um, I'm really enjoying smart sheets for project management. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's... um, it has a visual component that is very easy to navigate. Like I like Gantt charts. So they have yeah. a really nice Gantt chart component, which I find lacking in stuff like Asana and Trello. I don't know. It's personal preference. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, scheduling software like Calendly. And sometimes it's actually something I don't use on a completely daily basis, but I do use it often enough when I have a big project that I need to figure out. And that is mind mapping. And I don't need necessarily any kind of mind mapping software because frankly, I haven't found anything and I looked, you know, pretty much in depth, but I haven't found anything that would do better than pen and paper for mind mapping. Oh, that's interesting. That I, I, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, and I really, I appreciate that because I think that's another thing a lot of people struggle with is trying to find the system, you know, everyone says, oh, this system's great, that system's great, this program's great. And then they try and use it and it doesn't really feel comfortable for them and they feel like they should be able to, but they can't. So, you know, hearing a systems expert say, hey, sometimes I use pen and paper and you know, that's my best method. <laughs> you know, it's a rich topic that you just brought up and I love exploring it because what happens very often that people love tools. People think, you know, 
proverbially, if I buy the best golf clubs, I would be a much better golf player. I had, I know nothing about golf, right? I just heard the example, but the system by definition is not just the tool. It's the tool with the process that you use it for, right? If you have your calendar, if it's beautiful and it's color coded and it has, you know, default reminders for everything, but you don't check it and you don't put stuff in your calendar religiously, it's kind of useless. It becomes a burden yeah. rather than something that supports you. And it's true for every system. The tool is, first of all, the tool is the nice and shiny and dopamine inducing thing that, oh God, I got this new tool and it's exciting and now things are going to be so much better. Maybe, but you need a strategy to use this tool consistently and you need to figure out, oh, figure out is not, you know, yes, you need to figure out the tool, but you need to be mentally prepared for the fact that there will be a learning curve, even with the most intuitive of tools. There will be a learning curve. There will be this period when you might develop a love-hate relationship with it because it, you know, for instance, when I started using Squarespace for my website, it was incredibly frustrating for the first couple of weeks. Is it a great tool? Does it allow you to build beautiful things without any coding knowledge? Yes, absolutely. It's extremely capable. But there are little quirks and little, you know, things that you kind of have to get used to, that you need to figure out, that you need to read the manual sometimes. And yeah, it's, it's really frustrating at first. Now, this is somewhat of an extreme example because we're talking about something complex. But almost every system, like using Zoom, right? We're now talking over Zoom. Yeah. I just had a client um, who preferred to Skype because she can't handle learning another software. She's like, no, 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 no. We're going to Skype. I, I can't. I, I can't bring myself to like, you know. So even something as simple as Zoom may have a learning curve. And I think it's really important to keep this in mind when you're being seduced by another new shiny tool. Oh, I do too. And I think that's so great. And such a, a liberator for people listening because right now they know, oh, right. See, I don't have to do that. Or I have to make sure I give myself time. That Just because right. it's quote intuitive doesn't mean I should pick it up instantly. Right. And if there's nothing wrong with you if you don't get it on the first try. That's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That, that is great. So, but when we, so when we talk about um, implementing systems, um, other than feeling like it's complicated, are there other stumbling blocks that you find, you know, business people running into that, that gets in the way of them implementing successfully? There are a few, and it really depends on the person. So, I'll talk about some common things that I see. Great. So one scenario is when you try to implement a system that is really not compatible with your way of thinking. A good example would be, let's say you decided that you really need to get your finances in order. And from now on, you're going to keep a really good budget and use a spreadsheet or use one of the, you know, this online tools. And this is what you're going to do. And then you figure out that actually there, you know, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Maybe because you're a really visual person and the system you've created for yourself or somebody created for you is just a wall of numbers. And you can't look at a wall of numbers because very, very soon you lose connection to it. Like it becomes meaningless. You have to really make an effort to look at the numbers and translate back to yourself, what the heck do they mean? And it becomes tiring and it becomes kind of depressing and you abandon it. And that's the next thing, like you, that, that struggle very often leads to not using the system consistently. You don't use the system consistently. Every time the resistance to use the system grows and you abandon it. And then you're like, again, without a system and the system didn't work and you become probably more of a mess that you were beforehand because this disappointment, uh, you know, adds up. 
Another thing that I see people struggle when they try to implement system, again, it boils down to using a system that doesn't work well for you personally, is this fear that a system is really going to change something fundamental. Because, you know, we as human beings, we don't like change. So, for instance, if you suddenly implemented, not suddenly, but let's say you decided to implement a system for running your team differently. And you need to communicate with your team, say, twice a week instead of whenever the inspiration strikes. There is this fear, sometimes subconscious, that your team may not like it. They may rebel. They may decide that you don't trust them. Uh, because, you know, they're fully formed adults and they will just tell you if something's wrong. Why are you doing these reviews with them? Why are you, you know, putting a rigid framework around their communications? <clears throat> Sorry. So when you're afraid to use it because you kind of fear the change that the system would bring about, again, you're more reluctant to use it. You don't use it consistently and we're at the same spot where the system doesn't really work for you. I think these are the two biggest, you know, fundamental things. One, the system is not compatible with your way of thinking. And two, on some level, you resist the change that the system would bring about. Yeah, I, I think those are great. Uh, absolutely great. I, I can see them. Um, so people sort of set themselves up for failure because they, they have such a negative feeling toward uh, whatever the system is that they need to implement. Right, the new process, even, you know, stuff like, I'm trying to think about an example. I'm blanking an example. <laughs> but That's okay. um, it, it usually, usually it's more pronounced when it comes to money, systems around money and systems around communicating with your own teams. You know, um, yeah, and it's funny when you were talking about like setting up a financial system you're not comfortable with. Um, I totally relate to that. And I think a lot of people do like QuickBooks. I don't like it. And a lot of people don't like it, but they think they're supposed to like it because their CPA tells them this is the system you need to be using. Bless you. I can relate so much. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, I do not enjoy QuickBooks. Forgive me, all the QuickBooks people. I know you're <laughs> like, it's really working for you. But my feeling specifically about QuickBooks, right, that it's built for accountants and yeah. for really big firms that may have their own accountants, which means it's truly capable. It have you know, it has everything. It connects to everything. It has this wonderful capabilities, but it's really complex and clunky to navigate. And if you are a small business that, you know, not a small accountant business, it's a lot of overhead on your part. It's a lot, you know, it's uncomfortable. It yeah. becomes a burden. So if you use something more intuitive, even stuff like, I don't know. FreshBooks is a little better in my experience. Um, I used to like uh, Get Harvest. I don't know, something, their interface changed a little bit. So I'm not as enamored with them as I used to be. But my point is, you know, use something smaller, use something online, something lighter. Yes, it probably won't have all the little, you know, weird scenarios and an answer to every obscure question but you don't have to carry this weight, you know, if you're not an accountant. So yeah, yeah. I'm totally with you on QuickBooks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, be, because of that, let's talk some about custom systems for small business owners. Why do you think that's an important thing for small business owners to do? Precisely because when you make a custom system, you can make it as compatible with your personality and with your business needs as you need. So the system, let me take a step back. A system in order to work has to fall on one of the two sides of the scale between completely unnoticeable to really, really engaging. So a good system is either something you kind of don't know that it's even there right? 
So for instance, a good sales cart, you know, that does things automatically for let's say your e-commerce business, you only see when people purchase more or less. You don't have to ask them for money. You don't have to make sure the money got transferred. You don't, you know, you don't need to make sure that if they entered a coupon, they will get their discount. It's all automated. You just see the results. You set it up, let it go. On the other hand, there are other systems that in order to really work have to be very, very engaging. So you enjoy using them. And a good system of that would be, you know, we talked about team communication. So let's say you have a team meeting once a week, make it really, really, really fun. Make sure everybody's hurt. Make sure you say, bring luxurious drinks. And I'm not meaning alcoholic drinks necessarily, uh, but you know, stuff like cappuccinos. Do a game night at the end. Do something to make it really, really, really engaging. Okay, so people look forward to it. So you look forward to it. Because if it's anywhere in between, it becomes boring, it becomes kind of tedious. And again, you end up not using it. Now, when you're a small business, you have the luxury, in a sense, to make a system that is better suited for you. For instance, we were talking about, you know, a wall of numbers in your budget. If you're a visual person, you can make it visual. You can set it up so there are like graphs and charts. And if that's how you process information better, more power to you, you can do this. Um, you can create a schedule that works specifically for you and for your needs. So for instance, if you know that for your creative work, you need a full day to focus and, you know, little blocks of an hour here and there are just not going to cut it for you. You're not going to be able to concentrate enough to produce anything meaningful. You can create your own schedule that would work well with your own focus patterns. So stuff like that. Interesting. I, I, I see. I feel like that is really liberating as well. But it does lead me to another question, which is how does someone know when it's time to switch to a better system? That's a wonderful question. Well, basically, it's simpler than it sounds. If a system is working, don't, don't touch it. Yeah. Right? When something becomes painful, when something really hurts, then you need to look why it's happening. And very often you need to switch to a different system. You might need to, you know, you might need to do something fundamental as change your business model. Yes. But sometimes, you know, maybe you have outgrown your system. Maybe, you know, what you did before has too many steps and you don't have the luxury to go through all these steps anymore. You know, let's say you had an onboarding process for your clients and it was very long and had a lot of admin and it was okay when you had say 10 clients, but now that you've grown, you have 50, you can't sit for like an hour and a half dealing with paperwork, right? You need to do something better. You need to streamline the process. You need to maybe come up with a clear list of questions. Maybe you need to automate a payment system. Maybe you need um, to limit you know, maybe you need to filter your clients better now. Maybe you need to raise your prices. So the system around bringing clients into your business needs some adjustment because, because it's hurt, because, you know, you can't deal with it anymore. Yeah. Another scenario when you need to let go of systems is a little different in my experience. Um, and I'm speaking from like a very personal place right now. I'm a very systems oriented person. Like I said before, I have an Excel spreadsheet for my spreadsheet for my spiritual practices. But sometimes there are things that you can't apply a system to, or at least you need to feel free and realize that 
it's not the place and time to use a system for it. And in my experience, when it comes to dreaming, when it comes to really, you know, feeling liberated and kind of digging into yourself and trying to find what it is that you really want in the next phase of your life or in the next stage of your business, this, you know, systems should be thrown out of the window. You just, you know, you just need to, you know, sit back, maybe relax and be yourself and kind of listen and give yourself the freedom to go wherever your imagination takes you without thinking like through the steps of a process. That's awesome. I, I so agree with that. And I'm so glad that you said that because I was, I was actually going to ask if there are areas where systems can actually be harmful instead of productive. And I agree with you. I, I think that really is a place where you, you just need to let things flow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Okay. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Transform Your Company by Alex Vorobiev and The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients by David A. Field. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Marina Darlow about essential systems that you need for a, a sustainable business. So Marina, um, let's talk about tools versus systems. Um, so my question really is, are they the same thing? And if they're not, what is the difference between them? Ah, one of my favorites. Tools are things like software, things like basically what you use to engage well, you know, a bigger system. So your calendar is a tool. Your notebook is a tool. Your invoicing software, be it PayPal, be it, you know, part of your CRM, they're all tools. Now, if you add a process, namely how you use those tools, you put meetings on your calendar and you add Zoom links to them. You check your calendar every morning or you know, every morning, every night and every week whatever. This is already a system. So it's a tool plus a process. And sometimes a tool can be called a container. Uh, for instance, if you use your Google, Google Drive, right, or Dropbox or any of these services, this is a tool. A process of putting stuff in your Dropbox, for instance, if you're, let's say, a photographer, Photographers actually use different things, so that's a bad example. But let's say you know you use Dropbox in your business, putting documents in folders uh, and knowing which document goes to which folder is a process. Automating it to some degrees also it's a process. So together you have a system for keeping your information organized and hopefully safe. That's a system. Thank you for that. I totally get that. That, that's, yeah, completely clear. That's great. Okay. So, so the system is how you use the tool. The system is a process uh, including the tool, right? It's something yeah, repeatable, right. something that, you know, you can use yourself every time without making new decisions and something that you could usually hand off to somebody else, provided you know, that this is compatible with them. So for instance, if I hire a VA to handle all my payments, right? 
my transaction. I tell her, okay, this is how we do it. This is where you look in PayPal. Um, this is how you invoice people. Uh, these are the prices. This is what, you know, this is a template for writing a thank you letter to them, something like that. So every step of the system, including the tool, is charted out and explained so well that another person can do it instead of you. You know, you had one of the episodes uh, talking about replacing yourself, right? Yeah. And a system is essential if you want to scale and kind of clone yourself or take yourself as a bottleneck out of your business. So that, that piece of a system is really, really critical. Or I having a system. Yeah. That's great. Okay, thanks for that. Thank, thanks for that clarification. Okay. Um, so if we have people listening and they're thinking to themselves, okay, I understand the value of systems, but if I implement too many of them, it's going to create, it's going to make it more rigid in, in my organization. Um, and so I, I, and I don't really want to have it be that rigid because I want to be able to be creative. What would you say to them? Well, first of all, that it's an excellent way of thinking. You don't want systems for the sake of systems. Huh. Really not. The yeah. whole point of systems is to allow your creativity to flow better, like to allow more creative time to produce better work, you know, to feel more fulfilled with your work. So first of all, don't put systems for the sake of systems in place. And I think you need to be strategic. You need to see where things are working and where they need some tweaking. And you might want to put systems only where, you know, there's a mess. As a rule of thumb, there are some key areas that you absolutely have to have systems in. And that would be money because it's, well, I feel almost silly kind of expanding on it, but <laughs> oh, yes, we all need money. Absolutely. And we need, you know, we need make, to make sure that human mistakes don't cause money leakages. Right. But also, and that's something kind of less talked about, money is a very emotionally charged subject. And especially it's so for a small business, right? When you are IBM, money is most very important, but you have all the resources uh, to fall back on. And it's a huge organization. So if you are, you know, say a programmer at IBM, you know, you get your salary and you don't engage very much with money. You may have a budget for a project if you like a team lead, but again, it's, it's not something that directly puts food on your children's plate, right? Once a small business money becomes even more charged, like by orders of magnitude. So please have a system around money. And that means sales, that means invoicing, that means pricing, that means expenses, budgeting, cash flow, all these things, just to eliminate as much um, stress and negative emotion as possible and to limit mistakes. So that's one where you absolutely need systems. It's a good idea to put systems around communications and that doesn't have to presuppose that you have a team because you need to communicate well with your clients. You need to communicate well with your joint venture partners, with your vendors, service providers, stuff like that. So you need a clear system to communicate with everybody. And you, you can use a few scenarios, right? Uh, yes, of course, you have to leave some room for, flexi for flexibility. Like, you know, nobody likes completely canned responses, but it's okay, like it's okay to have a skeleton for every scenario. So we said money, we said communications, sales, obviously. And again, such a charged subject. I remember when practicing one of my first sales conversations in like a business program group, um, it was a very, very safe environment. Everybody loved everybody. We were like a few women starting our businesses. And the person sitting next to me right before we started practicing said, Marina, please don't have a panic attack. Because I was shaking. Like it's so, <laughs> so hard. Sales. Many people feel that it's icky and it's gross. And now you put your baby, like the product or the service that you created with your heart and soul, you put it out there and you slap the sales 
um, idea around it and it's like so uncomfortable. Yeah. Systems can do wonders for this process. There's a lot of mental work involved, obviously, but a system can actually help when you go through a set of questions with a person you sell to, or again, when it's automated, then of course, um, it's very different. Again, it makes it so much easier. And that's before saying that, hey, you know, <laughs> I actually need to charge people for what I'm doing because many people are uncomfortable asking for money. So if you have to go through this discomfort every single time, you're going to be pretty miserable and you're going to miss payments. So you need a system to make it easier for you. Again, either automated or outsourced or just something with very, very clear expectations up front. And that last bit is probably more relevant to you know, people in the service fields like coaches and consultants and maybe lawyers and so on. So we said money, we said um, communications, we said sales, time management. You know, it's very important, especially by the way, for creative people, because in my experience, it's very easy to, you know, get sucked into a creative vortex when you're just doing your thing and it's amazing and you don't want to stop. And it's great. It's wonderful. This is how big things are really brought to this world. But if you want to make it, you know, a business, if you want to make a living, you need some kind of schedule. So you need a system for managing your time. Again, it doesn't have to be something rigid. You don't have to like punch a card every single day, but there has to be something. Um, let's see if I forgot something. Money, time, sales, communications, uh, I'm probably blanking on something. People, well, it falls into communications. I think yeah. these are the these are the critical ones. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely need systems. They can be loose. They could be kind of sort of systems because it's better than no systems. But they have to be in place. Yeah, yeah. That that's awesome because one of the things I really like about that is <clears throat> it's very specific. But you didn't say everything. So and and before when you were talking about. You know, you don't want to have systems on the creative process, right? Because you want to be able to have that flow that, that it's, uh, for, that for me, it, it feels like you put the systems in place where you need them to keep you safe, where, where you, you need them because if you didn't have them, things could and probably would fall through the cracks. Right. Your creativity is not necessarily one of those things because it's you. You're, you're going to be creative when you are. So um, it, it's sort of a, um, I guess I'll call it like a safety hatch, right? That having systems, like I know when I was um, early in business and I was running a department, whenever something got missed, you know, I would say, okay, we just need another step in the system. You know, apparently right. we've got a hole here. Let's just add another step in the system and now let's do it and see how it goes. Right. You know, how you put preventative measures when something really bad happens. You know, at some point, the car industry decided to use safety locks or like child locks, right? Because yeah. the children were opening doors in the back when the parents weren't looking. Uh, so it's kind of like that. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Uh, let's talk about how a good system or good systems can help people build resiliency in their entrepreneurial journey. Well, that's one of my favorite topics because as I guess a career, entrepreneurship is a roller coaster like no other. Like seriously, I've spent over a decade in corporate and I'm probably one of the more, I guess, stable people, more stable people I know with an incredibly supportive environment. And I still really feel the ups and the downs, like the amplitude of emotion that entrepreneurship brings up is ridiculous you know yes there are professions that are very stressful as well absolutely uh 
but entrepreneurship is right there at the top with them. Yeah. And therefore, we as business owners need to make sure that we have what I like to call, it's, it's a term that I heard coined by Dr. Emily Onhold, emotional fitness. I'm not sure if she invented it, but I really like the term emotional fitness. And good systems help keep you sane because they spare you first the need to make constant decisions. You know, there's decision fatigue. Um, I read this great post about uh, a parole officer. So they tend to be, I think, more lenient in the morning. But as the day goes on, their decisions become rash and they become more annoyed. So if you need to go on parole, you'll be luckier if you know, you're slaughtered in the morning. And this phenomenon is due to what's called decision fatigue. When we make all kinds of decisions throughout the day, our decisions get progressively worse. Now imagine if a big chunk of your decisions is automated. You don't need to make them or something is helping you make these decisions, right? Um, the classic example would be put your sneakers, you know, right next to your bed so you go run in in the morning. Never yeah. worked for me, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm one of those people, you know, there's this meme that says, if you see me running, uh, start running too because someone is probably chasing me. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. Uh, but I do, it's just not my favorite type of exercise. Uh, but uh, I do believe in it as an example because if there is a system that helps you make a decision, for instance, uh, if, if there is a reminder going off on your phone, right, that you need to take your vitamins every morning, you don't need to think about taking your vitamins, you'll just take them. Uh, all these little things. If there is a slot in your calendar where you sit down with yourself and check your cash flow every week, you don't need to worry about forgetting what's going on with your cash flow. You don't need to think, oh God, what's going on with my money? Oh, I need to check it obsessively or I can forget about it. All these like little, little things, uh, big things, systems in general help you make fewer decisions. So your decision power um, remains for what's truly necessary for growth, for your relationships, for things that are really meaningful rather than, you know, what exactly am I going to do next with uh, this client? That's one way. So the systems keeps us, keep us sane in this way. Uh, another way that the system really help us be resilient is because when we break something, right, when there is a crisis, Systems, if they are in place, help us get back on track. So there's the benefit of just getting back on track, right? And there's also a benefit of knowing that when the crisis comes along, as it inevitably will, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you have the safety net. You have the steps to go back, right? So the crisis does not loom at you as a potential, you know, wrecking ball that would take you completely out of business or would wreak havoc on your family or your relationships, right? You have a set of systems that will gradually bring you back. I'll give you an example. I had a client once and fairly early on in our work, we designed a perfect week for him. You know, we decided how exactly he's going to navigate his projects, what he's going to do, you know, on a recurrent basis, what he's going to delegate, so on. And he had this really nice weekend for a couple of weeks. Uh, he was, you know, doing fundraising every Monday and he was dealing with the software side of his company, you know, certain times on Tuesdays and so on. And then, because that was before we got to the morning part, he calls me uh, one day and says, I absolutely have to cancel our meeting because if I don't raise, I think it was $30,000 by Friday, my company ceases to exist. I'm like, wow. okay, go ahead. Call the donors. 
Call up everybody on your list. Throw this perfect system for your schedule out of the window. And that's what he did. And he, you know, put his nose to the grind. He raised the money. And then when this kind of settled down, when the money was back in the bank, he could go back to operating on the schedule that was already designed for him. He could go back to dealing with his software projects on certain days. He could go back to fundraising on kind of a regular basis on his Mondays or like writing material for you know, future fundraising. Basically, his schedule was waiting for him and he already knew that you know, he won't be overwhelmed next time he opens up his computer, next time he starts his week or next time he gets up in the morning and needs to see what the day has in stock for him. So it frees your brain. Absolutely. So that you can, right? So you can focus on stuff in a minute because you're not so trying to hold everything in your head and worry about making sure a bunch of things get done. I, I love that. Wow. Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, stuck there because I so get it that, um, and, and being able to just jump right back in. Cause I do, I think that's one of the things that, I find, you know, when I talk to people that they really struggle with because they, they feel like they get interrupted all the time and then they just don't know what to do. They feel like it totally derails their day. So, you know, you actually bring up a really, really great point. Uh, and I love the word derailed. I was looking for it earlier. You know, I want to be very careful when I'm talking about coming back from a crisis. So there is this part when you're just got interrupted because, you know, your school extended problem called and said that your child, whatever, spilled water on another child and there's a dispute and you need to go and pick them up. Yes, that your day got interrupted, you got derailed, you go pick up your child, you have a conversation and then hopefully you can go back to work because, you know, the rest of your day is already planned and maybe you make something, but you can catch up. That's a fairly day-to-day -day kind of regular scenario. But then there's a scenario that there's like a real big, full-blown rocket-fueled crisis. And this is usually, you know, the getting back doesn't happen right away. And I, if I created this impression, I want to amend it. Getting back from a crisis is a process in and of itself. Uh, getting back from... It doesn't even have to be like a huge crisis crisis. It could be just a launch crunch time. Last summer, I launched my first ever pilot class. And it was a ton of work to the point when I didn't see my family for about two months. And when I finally, you know, when I finally taught my first course, I was so exhausted on that day. I had to, <laughs> I think I told the story multiple times in other podcasts, but the only thing that kept me walking upright was two scoops of espresso ice cream with fudge, or chocolate fudge on top. <laughs> I, because otherwise I was just there like sitting like a blob, right? And then after finishing teaching this course, I flew with my family for an epic, amazing, like soul searching, tectonic plate shifting trip uh, in the country when I was born. It was truly an epic proportions family experience. Now, then I got back. Do you think I got right back to my schedule and I started blogging and pitching and doing everything as, as if nothing happened? No. Well, there are probably few superhuman people that can. I definitely don't belong to this uh, supreme race. No, I had to really go through a process of kind of recovery of not just getting back to my 100% productivity. For a while, I felt like I won if I was at maybe 30%. And the good thing that came out of it that I truly created a process of coming out of a crunch time back to your like reasonably functional. Uh, I have a series of blog posts about it because it's not something to be taken for granted. But the fact that you have a system in place from, from beforehand really, really, really helps. Like you climb these ladders gradually, you, you 
restart implementing another system and another system, and you take up another something because it was already planned. And step by step, you get back to your regular fully functional self, but it doesn't happen immediately. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you for, for that clarification. I think that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that's really um, valuable. So, uh, Marina, I got to tell you, I, I really have enjoyed this conversation. I've had some light bulb moments uh, while we've been talking, just because it's such a um, valuable way of looking at how systems can help, how systems can hurt, um, but, but really how small business owners can and should embrace setting up systems where they are really valuable and not getting caught up in this. It has to be uh, the latest and greatest. You have to use the latest and greatest tool to set up your system or um, really anything. It just sounds like it's more figure out the systems that work really well for you because those are the ones that you'll implement. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So great. Will you tell the listeners, uh, you know, how they can find you, what you've got going on? Thank you, Diane. I really enjoy the conversation. You ask excellent questions. Uh, so come visit me at vision-framework.com or vision-framework.com because I build frameworks for visionaries and hence the name of the website. Um, you can find a free class there that talks exactly about which system should you tackle first? You know, if there are so many systems that everybody's selling you, you need to implement, like, yeah, yeah let's take a step back. Uh, and this course would walk you through a series of questions to help you understand in your particular case, where should you start? What systems need TLC in your particular business, in your particular situation? And then there are little recommendations. So if you need a system to address a certain piece of your money aspect, go here or here. Like there are a couple of choices. So you can find it at vision-framework.com. Uh, I recently launched a podcast. It's called Systems Meet Humanity. So you're welcome to give it a listen and, you know, tell me what you think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, just look for Vision Framework. But you come to my website. It's, I'm so much nicer on the web, like uh -huh. over there. I kind of suck at social media. <laughs> yeah. It's a love-hate relationship with social media over yes. here. Yes. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. I highly recommend um, that people take you up on the course because um, they can get their, you know, those questions that they have answered. I mean, hopefully we've answered a lot of them here, but um, they should absolutely check out your website and your blog. I mean, uh, well, your blog and your podcast. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize you had done that. So that's great. We're going to have to take Thank a look you. at that. Um, what? I'll, I'm sorry, did you have something else you want no, to share? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I also want to thank the listeners and our sponsor um, to get your free trial and your free audiobook from audible.com. Go to audibletrial.com slash business growth. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. The Jim Stroud Podcast explores the discoveries and trends forming the future of our lives. Brain-to-brain -brain communication, robot bosses, microchip implants for workers, and artificial intelligence replacing human workers are all happening now. If you want to know what's happening next, subscribe now to the Jim Stroud Podcast.